integrated pest management, which she has been practicing since 1985. In 2000, she was one of the found, founders of the Museum Pest Working work, Museum Pest Network. She is an active member of the American Institute for Conservation and the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. And now I turn this over to Gretchen Anderson. Hi, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to attempt to. And there we go. I think. Yep. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Uh, Did I do it right? I saw it there for a second. I see it. Um, you got it? Is it in Does everyone else see it? I do. I can see it. Okay. 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 Good. Up. We're good to go then. All right. Um, as Mike mentioned, I am the. No, I don't want to do that. What did I hit? All right. Okay. Hopefully, I'll be able to stay on track here. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Gretchen Anderson. And as Mike mentioned, I have um, a lot of years of experience with integrated pest management in natural history museums. The current collection I, I manage has about... 11 million entomology specimens in it. At least that's what I'm told. I have not counted each one of them. Uh, during the following talk, I will be drawing on my own experiences and on intensive research by such colleagues as Tom Strang and David Pinninger. And I will be talking about the development of best practices and mitigation strategies in uh, integrated pest management. I will be referring to museums, but think in terms of the broader museum range that includes art, natural history, history, historic houses, site museums, and library and archives. I will be speaking mostly from the point of view of natural history collections, of course. Um, I would say that approximately, because of the size of our entomology department and our entomology collections, about two thirds to three quarters of our collections at the Carnegie are, um, put, are at risk for damage by pest, pest activity. During the talk, please think about uh, the following statement. Museums initially adopted IPM practices from the agricultural community, which I know is something that you are more closely involved with. Have IPM practices diverged between agricultural and the cultural heritage practitioners? And what can we learn from each other? We have learned, a, a, from the museum point of view, we have learned a lot in the past, but we've diverged and developed it on our own. So what do you think we can perhaps um, learn from you or you can learn from us. So historically, pest management meant eradication of whatever pest was present, usually through the use of poisons. I know this happened in both agricultural uh, situations as well as um, the museum scenario. It did not matter if the pests were in out in nature or in the house. 
some of my earliest memories, this is back in the 60s, are running behind trucks, spewing a sickly sweet fog designed to kill mosquitoes. We later learned that the sub this substance also killed all of the fireflies in the area, as well as presenting health hazards to both pets and people. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the smell of mothballs in a closet. As a child, I thought I was allergic to wool. Even the softest sweater would give me hives. It turns out I was reacting to the chemicals, the active chemicals in mothballs. The pesticides that were and still are available are not only deadly for the environment, but are a health hazard for people. These chemical compounds include carcinogens, neurotoxins, and cause all sorts of chronic in illness. I've, I've mentioned a couple of them on the um, slide. So the problem with poisons is that first of all, it kills off much more than is anticipated. It is a health hazard to people. Things like mouse poison is actually um, warfarin or coumadin, which is a blood thinner. Basically, the, they encourage mice to eat enough of this so that they bleed to death internally. It's a pretty nasty death. Uh, and of course, this is not sustainable. By the mid 1980s, museums were questioning the use of hazardous chemicals and beginning to explore alternative methods for pest control. Conservators and natural history scientists were noticing damage to their collections uh, from the chemicals, as well as feeling the health effects. Personally, I have seen fading in insect collections, probably caused by the use, the overuse of PDB, which has a bleaching effect. So museums started looking at the methods being used in agriculture, uh, particularly in warehousing of grains uh, at integrated pest management to reduce our use of pesticides and to better protect the collection, the health of the collection and staff. Carnegie Museum of Natural History was on the forefront of that this exploration in the 1980s with our entomology report uh, department doing some of the initial research. So these are some of the traditional forms of pest management in museums. Uh, when taxidermy first was started back in the 18th century, each taxidermist would develop their own methods using whatever poison was around and literally impregnate the hides they were using. Uh, there are a lot of traditional methods um, that taxidermists use, such as making arsenic-based soaps that they would spread on the interior of the collections. In, excuse me, insect collections and um, Plant collections were dust were often well insect collections as you know were um, loaded down with PDB and naphthalene. Plant collections oftentimes were impregnated with um, arsenic and mercury. So in the 1980s, there was this growing uh, awareness that traditional pest control was not working and that it damaged collections. Uh, fumigation was also used. Uh, there are mu museums that have uh, DT DDT in them. It's a pretty nasty scenario. 
So the advantage for integrated pest management in a museum setting is that it's both proactive and holistic because we have to monitor, we have to look to see what there is rather than just walking in and fumigating the entire building. It is safer for collections and staff. Um, and it encourages improved environmental control as well as improved awareness. In addition, and this is something a lot of natural uh, collections in universities as well as um, historic houses and small museums are not aware of. There are legal limits to what you can use in a public space, such as a university or a museum. So many of the museums, many of the pesticides you are using or might be using that you can still buy off the, the shelf are actually illegal to be used in a museum. So the basic goal of integrated pest management in a museum is to reduce the occurrence of the unwanted organisms. And these include insect pests, mice, rats, pigeons, and mold, amongst many other things. So um, the IPM basics that we use are determining, first of all, what critters are present, which ones are pests and which ones are incidental, trying to figure out why they are here, what they eat, and what their life cycle is. A successful IPM program depends on understanding which pests are present, their basic biology, their environmental preferences, their food preferences, and we identify those critters through um, monitoring and observation. The goal is to reduce the infestation. So once it has been, uh, the pest has been identified, the level of risk to the collection can be determined. For example, a beetle that eats the dead, dead skin, feathers, or insects in your collection is more of a threat to anthropology, the bird collection, and the insect collection. Alternatively, a, a ground beetle that has wandered into the building will not be, uh, a, a, does not actually pose a direct threat to your collection. Uh, it will stay alive long, however, it will provide a food source to those critters that might um, that might eat, move on to your collection. So let me first look at some of those pests. So these are, I can remember where I am here. There we go. So the following will show you some of the pests, some of the, the most things we are most concerned about are protein feeders, pantry pests or grain pests, the general feeders and the wood feeders. We also are concerned about vertebrates, some vertebrates and mold as mentioned. So here's one of our main museum pests, uh, the whole Tinea and Tineola uh, family of clothing moths that eat wool and fur, feathers, insects, all of that kind of thing. At home, when we find one fluttering out of a closet, we are lucky because we can take the clothing, wash it, or send it to the dry cleaners. 
as long as we clean out, thoroughly clean out the cupboard or source of the infestation, then that should take care of it if we keep our eyes open. Unfortunately, you cannot do that with museum collections. Uh, the red felt, the felted wool that you see is a, is a 19th century piece of a Native American headdress. I can't send that to the cleaners. So we had to find different methods to take care of it. Well, we know that wool moths are, uh, they come, they, their natural habitat is in the, in bird nests. So the first thing you can do is you can look to see if you have any bird nests around, or uh, if it comes through another scenario, for example, from another collection that you've just brought into the collections, uh, you can treat it in that kind of a form that I'll get into in a little bit later. Another major protein eater are the whole dermestid family. They're a very serious pest of any protein-based organic uh, museum collection. These are nature's undertakers. Their job, so to speak, is to eat dead things. In the museum, we use them to clean osteology collections. So we actually have um, a colony of them in the building. This can be very nerve wracking. No one besides a dermestid is better at removing all of the flesh, muscle, and tendon, even from the most delicate osteology collection without damaging it. However, let loose in the collection, they can seriously damage the specimens. Uh, there are many species that we are concerned about. Some are more common than others in museums. Dermestids uh, go through complete metamorphosis they're the most voracious, like the wool moth, at their um, at the larval stage, causing the most damage. They often pupate in wood, so if you have wooden cabinets, uh, you might they or cardboard, they will burrow into the wood to pupate. So that has to be watched. Most domestic larvae are torpedo shaped which you can see in this slide uh, with parallel uh, tufts of bristles in segments of their body. They range from 0.5 to 10 millimeters long, depending on the species, and the adults are oval and roundish. They like high humidity. Now, one of my favorites is the odd beetle. Thylodria is peculiar because it has, uh, it's sexually dimorphic. The male is at the top, he looks like a small beetle. The female is drawn um, on the lower left. Uh, and she basically looks like a deformed larva. And then the, the Larva stage is actually the um, a fairly typical small red, and he tends to turn up into a a C shape if if disturbed. Now that insect collection, the moth, the frass that you see below there, is um, odd beetle damage, and an infestation of these can be absolutely devastated. It is thought that they originally came from China and have been spread throughout the world in part by the exchange of natural history collections. 
the best treatment for them is thermal control. To that end, our entomology department systematically freezes the entire um, bug collection, which takes about 18 months. They run it through two walk-in freezers. Many of the, the insect trays are specially constructed to withstand the, the um, humidity shifts in thermal collection or in, in the three freezing process, thus protecting the, the collection. Pantry pests are a concern. Um, these are four of the major ones. Now, I they generally eat dried or processed food products. Like many of the pests, they often show where at least expected. I know of two serious infestations, one being a sawtooth gra grain beetle and the other the drugstore beetle that showed up in mammal collections. Turns out the grain beetle infestation was there because the preparator used cornstarch to absorb the fluids on the skin before he created his, um, his study skits. So they had plenty to eat and they caused plenty of damage. You can see the damage on the bottom of this particular uh, study skin. Uh, caused by the drugstore beetles. Then there are the general feeders, uh, bugs such as cockroaches and silverfish and book lice. Sometimes these can be controlled by simply changing the environment. All three of these particular ones like higher humidity and moisture. So if you can control that, uh, you're in better shape. Then there are the wood borers, termites, powder post beetles, carpenter bees, which can damage both wood collections and the structure of your historic house. There are plenty of incidentals. If you see spiders or centipedes, you know they're hunting something. So follow them, see what they're hunting, see where they're finding it. The incidentals are often not directly, do not directly impact the museum collection. However, they can provide a source of food for the bugs we don't want. Then there are the vertebrates, which we're not going to be talking about much here. Uh, yes, that ceramic bowl was chewed on by mice. And mold. Uh, mold is a problem that many collections have. Um, one of the issues that even for for collections that are not uh, susceptible to other pest damage, if you get mold on your labels, important information can be destroyed. Um, mold mold can be very damaging. And again, we're not going to be talking about that and control of your relative humidity is the best way to approach it. Now, how do we how do we approach these? Uh, conservation scientists have long identified 10 agents or factors of deterioration listed here. Pests, of course, are one of them. Now, the interesting thing is that some of these project some of these agents are interrelated so if you have water or incorrect temperature or incorrect hu relative humidity 
especially if the temperature is high and the incorrect relative humidity is high, you're going to have more problems with pests. So they are interrelated, but we are going to look most specifically at pests. All of these things can cause damage to your collection. Now, the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa developed a really interesting matrix to help us figure out how to respond to and mitigate all 10 factors. You look at three different levels, the building features, which would be the building itself, um, the environmental systems, portable fixtures, which includes things like cabinetry, casework, and other kinds of enclosures, and procedures. So what do you actually do? You can approach your response at any one of those levels and that the, the choice or at multiple levels for that matter. And the choice may be because of, in, because of financial or the museum structural um, functions and limitations. Then you apply these five agents or these five actions or control strategies to each one of the levels of response. It is always ideal to avoid. If you can't avoid, then you block the agent. And in this case, we're talking about pests. We detect or monitor, and then we respond. The last, uh, the last thing to do is recover and treat. So the IPM process generally starts with monitoring. We need to know what's there. Then we identify, we work at prevention, which goes back to goes back to these features and actions. Then we evaluate what our process was and how well it worked. And then we start all over again. It is a never ending process. So at the building level, uh, this is the Science Museum of Minnesota. And what we are looking at is, first of all, creating a sanitary perimeter. Now, not all places can do this. However, this museum was able to create um, this sanitary perimeter so there are no plants right next to the building. If you put plants next to your building, it's going to attract more of the pests that you're concerned about. Uh, there's no place for mice to hide. There is little reason for the majority of the pests that we are concerned about to come in through this way. We also have a very, very good environmental system that controls our relative humidity and our temperature. This limits our pests. Our portable fixtures. They include high quality storage cabinets. And notice that these are up, up, up off of the ground. So we can actually clean underneath them. Cleaning is a very important thing as you'll see in a few minutes. Exhibition cases, enclosures. This is often a more practical method because it's less expensive than some of the major building features. And then you have your procedures. Uh, your integrated pest management plan is 
uh, should include specific procedures on monitoring, on mitigation, on treatment. And I'm talking mostly about treatment for collections, housekeeping procedures, and foods and plants. It will also talk about who is responsible for what and what schedule that you actually um, will do these activities on. So for example, housekeeping procedures, and this may be one of the most important procedures, is you want to keep things clean and uncluttered so you can reduce favorable habitat for all of the pests. You remove the dust, you remove the, the dirt. It's also when you're doing your housekeeping, it's also a great time to keep your eye open to see if there's any damage or if you see bugs flying around. Procedures in food management. A lot of our pests like the same foods we like, or that it will provide better habitat for them. So one of the things you can do is identify where food should be. Probably shouldn't be in the offices if you can avoid it. It definitely should not be in your collections area where your collections are stored. So if you remove all of the, pet, the, the food from a collections area, you're gonna reduce the likelihood of, of critters that aren't already there coming back in. You wanna create standards for special events if your institution has special events in your museum or your collection spaces. Control where food is. You need to standardize cleanliness for kitchens and again, improve your housekeeping standards. Now, this is an issue mostly for museums, but you might want to think about it for your collection as well at a university. Do you have live plants in your collection space? If you do, they will be an attractant to other bugs that you'd rather not have in there, including flies. Again, flies and um, say pest mites that uh, red, what are they called? Red spider mites. They will provide a food source for the insects that you don't want. So in galleries, in offices, uh, generally around the building and definitely in your collection space. So here are the actions. Avoid, block, detect, respond, recover and, re and treat. So you would start with how can you avoid attracting any of the pests? How can you block? them from getting at your collection. How do you monitor or detect? Do you monitor and detect? And how do you respond? And then the final stage is um, treating, which freezing falls into. So here are some a couple of avoidance strategies. Many years ago, I saw a um, pest management lecture and the, the um, technician that presented used this wonderful infographic. Our pests and including all of our insect pests want the first three, want three things. They need food, they need water, which they may or may not get from their food and they need housing. They need a place to live. So if you can manage to break just one of those 
connections, then you can seriously reduce your pet, pest habitat. So if you have food in the space and you remove all of the food, you, you can seriously reduce the pests. Now, we know that our collections are part of that food, so you can't always remove that. However, maybe you can remove the clutter. So you want to avoid clutter, you want to avoid food and water, or develop procedures so that if you're going to have food and drink, or if you're going to have food in your collection space or drink in your collection space, make a procedure. Explain to everybody that they need to keep their water bottle closed unless they're drinking it or you have a covered cup and all garbage must be removed immediately from the collection space. That is, if you allow drinking in there. So blocking strategies. On the building level, you might encourage your maintenance people to caulk and seal all holes in the building as much as possible. You want to exclude them from your building or your storage space again as much as possible know that some of your um, infestation issues are coming from new materials coming in so how are you processing your insects are you able to quarantine those if you if you've collected a bunch of stuff to make sure they're not infested by the time they go into your collection? Have you set up a procedure to make sure they're clean? By clean, I mean not, not infested. So you want to exclude pests with storage furniture and preferably using pesticide, pest resistant materials. If pesticide is used, it, not, it should be only used on the perimeter. So you might be in a scenario where you can spray pesticide, use crevice spray to start knocking down that natural population of pests. But they're not being used on the collection. Now I like this image because the um, garbage can, one way to immediately reduce the amount of pests is to cover food garbage cans. So anything that food or uh, if you're preparing your specimens, anything that you're using to prepare specimens that's wet goes into a garbage can, have one that has a lid and make sure that that is emptied on a daily basis. And I have just hit the wrong button on my end. Yeah. Sorry, I've just, okay, we're gonna, there we go. Um, monitoring or detecting strategies. Now, when you're looking at avoiding and blocking, you avoid first. If you can't avoid, then you come up with strategies to block. Now monitoring is ongoing at all the all the time. So we use sticky traps uh, sometimes with pheromones to 
to a, to find out what is in your your uh, collection so we can get a positive id and and develop our response and treatment strategies one of the things to do and i happen to have this on botany on our botany collection but the same thing has been done for the insect collections make a map identify where you put your traps identify where you're finding your infestations the closer that you can come to identifying and documenting that the better you are the the more the better you will be at finding where the problems are and focusing on those problems in this case we have windows on three sides of this storage room well windows are a really good place to place your traps because most of our insects will fly to the windows and then they will die uh, there was another reason i was doing that which i hope they'll have time to talk about then then there are your response strategies in repairing your building in modifying your environmental conditions improving your housekeeping uh, at every single level both in the building features in portable fix through portable fixtures and through housekeeping now recovery or retreat there are no or treat there are a number of ways we can go about it as we've said, we don't want to poison our collections anymore. We want to reduce that. So we examine and we isolate. Isolation can be as simple as bagging the collection. Now with insect collections, if you have Cornell drawers, take a look at how tight those Cornell drawers are. If they are very tight, which they probably aren't, your insect, your larva will climb, will crawl from drawer to drawer. If they are really tight, or if they are sealed with white tape, with clear tape, then you've pretty much isolated them. Really the best way for natural history collections to eradicate an infestation around in your insect drawers is through thermal treatments. And you can either freeze or heat. Now freezing, if you can put you, first of all, you double bag or you put an additional layer of protection over that, that um, the specimens, that will reduce the loss of relative humidity, which is what oftentimes is causing damage to the collection. You can also, you should also freeze them for at minus 20 degrees centigrade at least for, for anywhere from 48 hours to a week, the longer the better. Preferably, you want to be using a freezer that is not uh, does not have a defrost cycle, because that breaks, that heats up the freezer a little bit and reduces the effectiveness. Another way to do it is with heat at 55 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry, I miss I mistyped. 55 degrees centigrade. Uh, another popular way to do it, but takes longer and is much more expensive is anoxic, which using CO2, nitrogen, or ageless to eliminate all the oxygen. Now, one key aspect is once you have treated your Cornell drawers, you need to clean the, the interior of the Cornell drawer to remove all insect frass because if the frass is still there you're not going to be able to tell if 
your treatment was successful or not. So here are a couple of my adventures. Oh, I'm getting very close to time. I will go through this fairly quickly. So the most recent activity action we have done is with our entomology collection. As you see, we have windows in the room. We have a brand new curator of entomology who is very familiar with the integrated pest management in an agricultural setting. So she and I have combined to move forward on improving their, their IPM. So she, ha she has cleaned all of the windowsills, which were thick with dead flies. She is in the process in this slide of cleaning all the spaces and decluttering her collections area. It's done an amazing job. They are improving their housekeeping. They can now vacuum uh, most of the floors. We are in the process of improving the seals on all of those wi windows, and they are systematically cleaning, examining the drawers and freezing the collection and documenting everything that they're doing. There, what we found a large collection, maybe a thousand drawers of papered leps that had not been dealt with at all. So I volunteered two of my interns to help her go through all of those, those um, boxes, bag all the papered leps, clean all the boxes and then her technicians ran them all through a freezer it took over six months but now we know what has been frozen and what has not another insect issue that we had during covid was I discovered a carpenter bee infestation in several of our collection spaces. Turns out it had been going on for years, but it had never been reported. The windows on this third floor storage area were so badly um, infested that several of the windows had to be completely replaced. We worked together with our, our um, contract pest technician to block all the holes from the carpenter bees. They're not a, they don't cause damage to the collection that was inside the room, but they were not doing good things to our historic building. And again, this is the um, botany space that I was monitoring and the steps we took. We also had a honeybee infestation on one of our external storage areas. And the what we ended up doing was bringing in a beekeeper who was able to relocate the hive well away from where our collections are. I'm going to skip over these. So, with integrated pest management, we need to have a lot of collaboration. We need to move forward with working with our collection staff, our curatorial staff, in your case, your students, setting procedures and improving housekeeping. And we can't do that without everybody being involved. Uh, since I am beyond time, I'm going to jump over that and say thank you. Most of the photographs either I took or some of my colleagues in a number of places. The cartoons were done by Vern Anderson. And many thanks to Tom Strang, Canadian Conservation Institute and the, Pest Muse the Museum Pest Network. So I am going to close this off and unshare my screen.
if I can figure out where I am. Uh, not sure how to do that. Uh, you should be able to just click um, on screen, on share, sorry. All right, hopefully I won't lose myself. I'm getting help. How do I get out of here? It's nice working with some, having somebody in the house who's really good at this. <laughs> Just close. Oh, there. I was on the wrong section. Stop share. There we go. Okay, good. Bella, I'm back. Yes. So we, we do have time for questions. Very interesting seminar. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Anderson? Go ahead, Chenglu. Yes, I have a question. Um, uh, this was a really nice talk. Uh, I teach urban entomology. Uh, one of the section is about uh, fabric insects, but also, you know, some uh, stored product pests are part of the, you know, museum pests. Uh -huh. So um, I worked uh, with insect collection a lot when I do the taxonomy work. Mm -hmm. So we always use the moss balls mm -hmm. and uh, DDVP strips to prevent uh, uh, damage. Um, of course, if you have the better drawers, like a Cornell drawers, and you're less likely to need this. But, you know, many cases, you have uh, collections that are not in well-sealed boxes. Right. As a prevention, how do you, you know, uh, use? Okay. What, what kind of products to use? Yeah, first of all, um, I would check with your local, um, I would check, to see if you're actually even allowed to use either of those in your collection, either mothballs or um, no pest strip. Uh, it can be very dangerous. It's a, they are human health hazards. Um, moths, moths are the first things I ever dealt with. And what you do is, set up a regular monitoring and a monitoring of the collection. First of all, if they're not in well-sealed boxes or well-sealed cases, think about monitoring in general, uh, monitor the space they're stored in. Also, um, basically just going through the boxes and checking periodically and and you can set up a time schedule to do that to see what is going on examination um, detailed examination is the best thing you can do and i know that there will be a lot of collections but the advantage is you guys have students and that can be part of their work with the collection. So set some kind of a procedure up for that. Um, and I would go, I would definitely go towards uh, using freezers, getting rid of all of the pesticides because they don't really work. We have found, I have seen beetles happily crawling on no pest strip perfectly and then I, I kept the beetle and it just went through its natural life cycle. Whereas freezing actually disrupts their life cycle. And even if some survive, the research is showing that they don't survive, they, they don't produce viable young. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. So you also mentioned that uh, uh, use uh, uh, maybe uh, nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Yep. Has anybody used the uh, carbon dioxide to fumigate? Uh, basically, that is how it's done. You have a, a very airtight bubble that you put your stuff in or a container that you put your stuff in. And then you march it 
you you pass the stuff through it takes it generally takes two to four weeks for that the nice thing about freezing is it is less damaging um, and less time consuming but um yeah that's that's a very common way to do it and if you go to the <clears throat> if you go to the canadian conservation institute's website uh, they have standard ways of doing that. Um, as uh, actually, I would go to Pe Pest Network, museumpests.net, and um, they have the best ways of following through with any of those treatments. Uh, very detailed instructions. Oh, okay. So for carbon dioxide fumigation, do you have to have a license to do it yourself? Good question. That I'm not sure of. Um, I don't think you do with CO2. No. Uh, nitrogen you might, but I, I am not sure. They should tell you on Museum Pestnet. I admit I am a freezer. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I, if I, I have a person I would call, uh, our our Andy Warhol Museum, which is part of our organization, uh, they use mostly um, anoxic. So, mm. but okay. I think you probably can do it yourself. And heating is another very very easy way to do it. Uh, like I said, I I put that down. Um, I I put the wrong temperature down, uh, but it's in centigrade, 55 degrees centigrade, not very hot. That's about 130, 140 Fahrenheit. And it, there's there are very easy ways of creating the containment that you have. That yeah, you, we, we okay. use uh, portable heaters to treat for uh, bad bug infested items. Mm -hmm. It's very effective. Uh, I'm just curious, would it affect the quality of the insect? Sorry, that say would, that uh, would uh, the heat treatment uh, affect the specimens, the insect it's specimens? Not at that temperature. Okay. Uh, there's a few. There's a few things you can't freeze. There's a few things you can't heat. Like if it's got wax on it, probably not a good idea. If okay. it's got natural resins on it, probably not a good idea. But most of um, DNA is not affected, as far as we know, by either the freezing or the heating at the temperatures we're talking about. Okay. Fats yeah. shouldn't be affected. Um, none of that. At least for the short time that it's being processed. Textiles, um, in general, textiles work really well with freezing or heating. But again, you have to follow the instructions mm -hmm. to prevent any damage. And part of the problem with PDB and moth, whether that's what's in mothballs or the naphthalene, is that it does have, it, it will uh, permanently damage dyes. Mm, right. Not to mention, make those of us working with it sick. Other questions? Yeah, does Please. anybody else have a question? Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? This is Daryl Forrest. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Um, I'm the actually the pest prevent, uh, prevention entomologist at the National Gallery of Art uh, in DC. Um, great presentation. Um, it's nice to see that uh, some of the things I've implemented are in sync with yours. So that makes me feel pretty good that I'm doing the right things. Um, uh, just a quick question. How do you feel about regular mouse traps as a monitoring device? We are trying to get away from those. Snap traps? Yes. Um, I think they're the best. You think so? Yes. They kill the, ins they kill the mouse almost immediately, 99% of the time. Whereas a, um, a live trap, the critter, the mouse is going to die, the mouse or rat, is going to mm -hmm. die within a day if you don't catch it. If they just die, obviously poisons are not the way to go. Right. Um, but 
um, let's see, and sticky traps, uh, again, it's a slower death. Right, it, we, um, we're, we basically have, the thing about the National Gallery of Art is a very aesthetic sort of environment. Yeah. So yeah. we have to sort of be very low key about how we put out our traps um, because yeah. the patrons or even some of the staff get a little fired up about seeing a, a mouse in a snap trap. Right. Um, but, how ahead. often do you have them? We, well, we were very strategic about where we put them. Um, I, I'm trying to get away from the office spaces. And we're also going with a tunnel trap where you can actually, you can put two snap traps in one of the tunnels and yeah. it's not obvious. So the, the mouse would go inside the tunnel and, and get snapped, then it's not visible. Yeah. Our main thing is, like you said, is we have to make sure that we know where these traps are. We have a map and we check them routinely. Yeah, you have to check them regularly. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're gonna monitor for mice, the snaps are the best. Okay. Um, but I would try and, and I mean, you've got such a, I know they're spread thin, but you've got such a fabulous um, facilities department. Yes, they are. They're, they're, uh, that they've been if, very good as far as helping us out with, um, because there's only me and another individual. And then I do have pest controllers that come in, um, but they have a specific routine and a specific right. regimen. So right. anything that's off their beaten path, it's sort of our responsibility. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm finding. As the only conservator for 22 million collections, that's my hard thing because I've got a lot of places I'm being pulled. Um, and so I can't monitor that re evenly. Right. That's, I think that's our biggest issue is we, it's, it's hard to keep track of what's going on because it's, we're very limited in our personnel, but you're right. We do use our facilities and our maintenance people a lot for a lot of the areas where we, you know, for, for uh, exclusion, right. sweeps, um, plugging holes, things like that. So, right. Yeah. So, I mean, that if it's an older building. So the question is, where where are they getting in? Are they living in there? Um, yes. <laughs> a lot of the patrons, not the patrons, but a lot of my staff go, well, they're coming in from the outside when it's cold. I'm like, no, they've established themselves here. Okay. So, yeah. So, you know, that makes it a little bit more challenging as well. Too. But, well, you also know you have um, an incredible resource at... Uh, natural history. Well, well, here's the weird thing is we are not part of the Smithsonian. Oh, and yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people think that the National Gallery of Art is with the Smithsonian and then with all their um, resources what? we can use. You're not? We're, we're all by ourselves. We're, we are um, independent from the Smithsonian. Not, not that I don't chat with those folks and get insight and stuff like that, which is great. But as far as using some of their facilities and resources, we are on our own. Okay, well, I would still recommend you contact Catherine Hawks. Okay. Okay, great. She and I have spent years recommending each other. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, it was a great talk. Um, look forward to, to more dialogue, definitely. Um, please my con time. Uh, please contact me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions? I have a quick one while, while Daryl's on as well, because he might know the answer to this. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I'm, I'm with a PhD student with Chang Lu, um, but I also work full time for a fumigation company. And um, we got engaged by Mary Ballard and Lisa at the Smithsonian. Um, I, I think it was back in February and March this past year. And we were working with uh, Yuri Yakushin from, um, oh boy, he's up in Jersey City. I can't remember the name of the company, but we were looking at doing um, anoxia with Argon. And yeah. it basically was a noble, but they were working on a rulemaking for um, uh, anoxia in the shipping line. So basically, instead of it being a preventative approach, it would be a proactive approach yeah. for curation devices that come into a museum prior to them being uh, curated and, and put in storage. 
Have you guys heard anything? Either of you heard anything as far as that rulemaking is concerned? I personally, I have not. I have not, and I would be very interested in it. I teach two courses on integrated pest management online uh, through Museum Studies LLC. And I try and give my students as many options as possible. So Shannon, if you could, um, could you email me that information? Yep, I got a copy of the proposed rulemaking from last year. Daryl, I'll, I'll try to do a Google search for you as well, and, and I'll, I'll include you in that as well. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I didn't talk uh, because I didn't talk about uh, some of the specifics in the Canadian Conservation Institute matrix because it gets pretty complicated, but they actually do talk about whether collections are in storage on display or in transit. Because of course, shipping collections, shipping specimens can be a lot of um, uh, that can be a lot of major uh, transfer of infestations. Yeah, what we've seen is that the rodent issues are often an embedded uh, mm -hmm. situation, whereas a lot of the insect activity is from introduced cargo. Um, right. So it's, it's kind of like you have to have both of those going at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah. I did a, at Science Museum Minnesota, we travel major, major natural history exhibits. And one of them was a collection of, of was about um, birds, um, uh, birds of prey. And it, I had to, fight tooth and nail to get all of the birds, most of the birds, encapsulated in, um, in, a, in cabinet, in casework, so that they were never open during the exhibit uh, as it traveled. I had horror, I just, I just was in terror of becoming the, the, Black Mariah of the the plague ship of an infestation as as the collection because those are generally dried skins they're really susceptible to infestation and it was going to all sorts of museums that I could not guarantee had a decent pest control system and so I can proudly say that I never that our collections never carried it from one museum to another. But yeah, that's that is a huge concern. Thank you. Yeah. And again, please feel free to contact me. I'll put my email in the, the chat. Any other questions? I think it's, I think we, we should go to our session with the students okay. at, at this point. So mm -hmm. Gretchen, we're going to take a uh, short five minute break in case okay. you want to get a glass of water or something. Great. And then we'll, we'll come just um, bring your screen back up and uh, we'll talk with the students. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. so much Gretchen you're most welcome I hope that was a fabulous you. talk thank you Great.
So is their entomology collection just their research collection, or is it actually part of a museum? Ah, uh, that I'm not sure. Yeah, it wasn't clear to me in his statements at the beginning, because no. he made it sound like they have well, a there museum. Are, there are multiple museums, uh, apparently. Yeah. Gretchen? Yes. Uh, oh, you may want to, um, I just I just heard you guys were I, chatting. You might want to mute your, your Okay, I guess we can start coming back on. If you can hear me, there we go. <laughs> so Gretchen, I have to apologize. I had to reboot my whole system in the middle of the of the talk uh because oh dear. the audio died and i couldn't get it going so i missed all the freezing stuff so oh okay we we have a recording so Good. We'll, I'll, I'll be able